Our scripture today is from the Gospel of John. I will say it's a story that I consider to be myth. So from the sacred myth of our faith, I read from John chapter 20. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. I grew up going to Sunday school every week, and this story that I've just read was one of those that always stuck with me. As a child, I suppose I always thought of Thomas as bad, Right? Jesus had been crucified. Then the other disciples told Thomas that Jesus was alive. They had seen him with their own eyes. But Thomas refused to believe it. He demanded to see Christ for himself. Thomas was the stubborn, doubting follower of Christ who had no faith. In my child's mind, the takeaway was clear. Don't be like Thomas. Believe. Don't doubt. There are a few stories in the Gospels of Jesus appearing to the disciples after he was crucified. As I shared last week, and as we often refer to, in my mind, these stories are highly symbolic and representative of a time in the development of our faith. They are not factual stories, and they contain great wisdom if we can approach them in that way. In every one of the stories of Jesus appearing after Easter, it's clear that Jesus' followers, his closest friends, knew Jesus in a different way after his death than they did before his death. Before his death, they knew him as a finite, mortal, flesh and blood human being. Specifically, he was a Galilean Jew. If his body was typical for that time, Jesus might have stood just over five feet tall, weighed maybe 110 pounds. This would be small by today's standards, but it's considered representative of a first century male. So Jesus, 110 pounds, soaking wet, had to eat and sleep like any other human being. He was born and he died. He was crucified. After his death, Jesus' followers came to know him in a different way, in a few different ways, actually, at least according to the stories that we have in the Bible. Paul experienced Jesus on the road to Damascus as a brilliant light and a voice. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, even if we did once know Christ in the flesh, That is not how we know him now. In the gospel stories of Easter, it's clear that Jesus after Easter is different 
from what he was like before his death. In our text today, from John chapter 20, Jesus passes through walls. He mysteriously enters locked rooms. Earlier in John, Jesus is mistaken for a gardener by the tomb. In Luke, two of his followers walk with him for some time on the road to Emmaus. They have this in-depth conversation with him without recognizing him. The post-Easter Jesus appears and then vanishes. We're not quite sure what this post-Easter Jesus is, but the Gospels accounts all indicate that he was significantly different after his death than the flesh and blood person they'd come to know before his death. Given the confusing, mysterious appearances of Jesus after his death, doesn't Thomas get a bum rap? Even though Thomas is rarely cited as an example of faithfulness, I think he should be. He's one of my favorite disciples. I might even identify with him a little bit. That's probably why he's my favorite. In several gospel passages, Thomas shows himself to be a practical, concrete sort of guy. Thomas is the kind of person who will say what's on everybody else's mind, but no one else is willing to speak up. Before he dies, for example, Jesus gives this long farewell discourse, at least according to John's gospel. Jesus assures his followers, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. Where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I'm going. All the other disciples just nod their head like they know what Jesus is talking about, but it's Thomas who says, Wait, what? We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Thomas is plain spoken and gutsy. He wants to understand what's going on and be able to face the situation at hand. Think about it. In our gospel story today, Jesus had already shown his hands and his side to all the rest of the gathered disciples earlier when Thomas happened to not be around. And Thomas is just not the sort of person to say, if all 10 of you saw Jesus at the same time, then that's good enough for me. Thomas finds this information that the other disciples tell him impossible to believe. He wants proof. He's merely asking for the same assurance that the others have already been told. It seems like a reasonable request. He says, unless I see it, I just cannot believe it. And with these words, Thomas becomes a stand-in for all of us who want to see something for ourselves before we decide whether it's true or not. It's so easy for us to distance ourselves from Thomas by pretending that we would respond differently. If we were Thomas, we wouldn't doubt, we would believe. Doubters get no respect. We're the Rodney Dangerfield of spiritual archetypes. When we call someone a doubting Thomas, it's generally not a compliment. So we assume that Jesus was chiding Thomas with his words, have you believed because you've seen me? But why do we hear these words as scolding? After all, Jesus shows Thomas exactly what he has shown to the other disciples earlier. He offers his hand and his side. Jesus gives Thomas exactly what he needs to believe. In our culture, doubt is often viewed as a weakness. We value strong, decisive opinions and actions. If a person has a strong faith, that means that they don't have any doubt. Doubt is implied to be a bad thing when it comes to faith. That's all well and good, but 
Maybe you too have had the experience of praying and wondering if anyone is listening, of questioning whether or not God exists. Who among us hasn't questioned the old religious formulas? I've known folks who begin to doubt and their faith crumbles, sometimes leaving them sarcastic and cynical. Maybe you are one of those folks. Some people keep their doubts, their thoughts, and their feelings about it to themselves because they don't want to be judged by people who seem to have all the answers. Others decide it's all a bunch of baloney and they give up altogether on religious faith or traditions that seem irrelevant or outmoded. Consider this parallel. Like all parallels, it breaks down if you push it too far, but it sometimes helps us to think about things differently. During these past few weeks, months now, of pandemic, the stock market, which had been soaring, began to fall and fall and fall some more, then rise a little bit and then fall again, depending on the latest effect of coronavirus and its widespread economic havoc, or on the latest press conference. For anyone with stock holdings, it's an extremely stressful time. That's an understatement. Some investors just want out altogether. They've seen the market spiral downward. They've seen their investments lose money, and for them, it's an intolerable experience. During times like that, fear rises. We're not sure what to do. Some investors respond by panicking and selling their stock, putting the cash in a metal box for safekeeping, so to speak. But financial advisors might say that it's a perfect time to buy more when the market is down. Religious faith is a bit like that, or should I say, religious doubt. When doubt creeps into our souls, it may frighten us. We may feel like hiding or running away. We may feel like opening the door to doubt, acknowledging doubt, embracing it even, is a slippery slope and we might lose it all. But what if we understood doubt as fertile ground for growing faith? Doubt prompts us to ask deeper questions, to notice things that were invisible to us before, to keep seeking out what is hidden, to test what we think we believe in order to see if it has staying power, in order to see if it has the power to sustain our lives. Tim Keller is a Presbyterian minister. He writes, a faith without some doubts is like a human body without any antibodies in it. We know what happens to a body without antibodies in it. It leaves us vulnerable. A faith without some doubt is like a human body without any antibodies in it. People who blithely go through life too busy or indifferent or afraid to ask hard questions about why they believe as they do might find themselves defenseless against either the experience of a tragedy or the long haul of a quarantine or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. A person's faith can collapse almost overnight if she has failed through the years to listen patiently to her own doubts and to engage them, to embrace them, follow them through and see where they take her. Maybe we're reluctant to confront our doubt because we're afraid that we'll find out we made a bad religious investment. On the other hand, if we are willing to take the risk 
and linger in the land of doubt. We may find doubt as the doorway into a vast expanse of faith. If we deny or run from doubt, we will always wonder what is or is not true for us. But if we face our doubt, we may just find that faith is real, that there exists a deeper unseen reality to our lives, that there is more to those old religious formulas than we thought. We might be surprised to discover that our trust in the universe grows simply because we had the courage to question. It takes courage to doubt. If we give ourselves permission, we may just find that faith is the best investment we could have made. 